In this video, we're going to have some fun with physics in Blender. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, we're going to take a little bit of a departure from some of the modeling practices that we've been learning in Blender, and we want to play around with particle physics. So we started this series because I felt there was a little bit of a gap between coming from a CAD program like Fusion 360 specifically and learning a program like Blender. They're very different worlds, slightly different modeling approaches, but we have a basis with forms in Fusion 360 that we could apply to some of the things we do in Blender. But unlike Fusion 360, which is primarily a CAD package, there's simulation, there's machining, there's also generative design, Blender is a visual effects package. It's made for animation, it's made for rendering, it's made for game assets. So there are some tools such as particle simulation and particle physics that are extremely powerful in Blender. And I think it's good that we take a step away from just the basic modeling that we're learning and we play around with some of the functionality. So first, I wanna get started by taking this default cube and I wanna just move it out of the way for right now. So I'm gonna hit G and Y and just sort of bring it off to the side. Then I'm gonna hide my camera and light and I wanna bring in two new objects. We're gonna to go to add, mesh and plane. And then I'm going to use scale, either S on the keyboard or scale to scale this out in plane. And this is going to be our ground. We're going to duplicate that. We can use shift and D on the keyboard, or you can go to object, select duplicate objects. And then we want to hit Z on the keyboard and we want to bring that up. I'm going to scale that down. So again, we can use the scale tool or we can use S on the keyboard and I want to just make it a little bit smaller. Now, the main reason that I want to do this is because we're going to be using a particle system. We're going to be emitting from this top plane and dropping things down on this bottom plane. Before I go too much further, I'm going to use this down arrow in the overlays. and I'm going to turn off my 3D cursor and the origin for now because I don't need to see them. It'll just clean up what we're seeing on the screen. Next, I want to rename some of these objects. So this plane, this duplicate, I'm going to double click on it in my collection, and I'm going to call this my emitter. Then the other plane, I'm going to double click on it and call it my ground. We can leave the name of the cube for right now just off to the side, and that'll be fine. So one of the things that happens with Blender, and I've been guilty of this too, is you see a video on a cool technique, a cool animation, a cool render, you follow along. And this was sort of the inception point for the whole Learning Blender Slow tutorial series, is that it's very easy to get in and follow along somebody that knows what they're doing. And then you can get that end result. You can get the animation, you can get the physics simulation, you can get everything to work out. But again, there's that piece of, of why you're doing something or learning what the actual options are that a lot of times I find is missing. Now, I won't say it's always missing. There are some great tutorials out there that cover all the nuances of the settings that you're using. But again, keeping in tradition with learning Blender slowly, what we wanna do is we wanna take some baby steps. We wanna take a very basic introduction. So for this, we're not gonna be using the object and quick effects, which a lot of times you come in and quick smoke or quick explode is a great way to get started by creating a fire or creating a smoke effect or creating something that will dissolve a mesh body and it'll turn it into a particle system. So while those are great, those are things that we're going to leave for right now. We wanna, we wanna understand the basics of adding a particle system and what that actually means. So for us to get started, the first thing that we wanna do is select the thing that we want our particles to come out of. Now, in this case, we've got a plane. It doesn't have to be a plane. It could be a mesh body, but it's important to note that when we create our particle system, it can be emitted from faces, can be emitted from the volume of our thing, or it can be emitted from other, other portions of it. So having a plane, just a simple plane, can be pretty handy for us because now what we're doing is we're just defining this big face, and it's just a single face, 
And we're going to have all of the elements come out of that. So now that it's selected, we're going to go to our modifiers. We're going to go to add modifier and we're going to select particle system. As soon as we do that, you'll see that particle settings are in the particle tab, which is now just below our modifier. So in the particle settings, the first thing you'll notice is that the top section is emission. And then we have a lot of other options going down. I think it's also extremely important that keeping in tradition with the other videos, what we are not going to do is we're not going to get to some end fancy animation or render that you can output and feel really good about. What we're going to be focusing on is learning some of the basics of creating a simple particle system. So we're not going to be getting to the render phase. We're not going to be outputting this and it's not going to look, you know, fancy when you view it on the screen. But what we are going to do is we're going to talk through the basic settings that are going to be important to understand. So before I change any other setting, what I want to do is I want to hit the play button and just see what happens on screen. So you can see that the top face that we created, this plane that we named emitter, is dropping particles from it. Now by default, if we look at our timeline, it's starting at one frame and going all the way to 250. So what we're doing here is we are emitting a thousand particles. They're starting at frame one. They're going all the way to frame 200. So you can see once we get to 200, they're gonna stop being emitted from that face or that plane. And then they have a lifetime of 50 frames. So what this means is that after 50 frames, the particles will start what they call dying. So we have unborn particles, which means that they exist before they start. We have particles while they're in motion, and then we have particles after they're dead. So this lifetime is essentially toggling them off, and the start frame is toggling them on. So if we change the start frame to, let's say, 50, and just hit Enter, as we get to 50 frames, then it'll start generating those particles. They'll go to frame 200, and then they'll stop. If we set their lifetime to something shorter, like 10 frames, then they're going to start disappearing before they ever hit anything else. You can see they're just sort of dripping off the top. 10 frames isn't enough for anything to happen. If we set this to something a bit longer, like 100 frames, you'll notice that they're going to fall for quite a bit further. If we increase our number to, let's say, 5,000, then what we're going to see is we've got a lot more particles. They're falling for longer. We can see that there are more coming from our emitter. If we reduce this value to say 100, we're only gonna get 100 particles. That's gonna be the total number of particles in our system. They're spaced out over the duration of our frame start and end, and they're all just sort of in the system. If we want all of them to start at once, we can set our frame start and our frame end value at the same number. So this means they're all gonna start at one and they're all gonna drop at once. So if we put our number back up to 1,000, that means 1,000 particles are created at once, and they're all dropping at frame one at the same time. So there's a couple other settings that we do want to talk about in here. And for this, I'm going to go back to frame one to frame 200, and I'm going to use that as my base setting, and I'm going to set the lifetime back to 50. So again, these were our default settings. The next number here is the seed number. And this one's a little bit trickier for us to visualize. So in order for us to see it, I'm gonna hide the ground and I'm gonna view this from Z minus. Now it's a little bit harder to see, so I'm gonna zoom in. And we can see the particles being generated on the screen. And while they look like they're kind of jittering around, what's actually happening is the particles are dying off as we're seeing them. So if we increase the lifetime to 200 frames, they're gonna live for the entire duration of this. So we're going to let it go back around to zero. And you can see that the particles are being created and they're sort of beginning to populate. If we set the start and end frame as the same number one, all the particles are being created here and you can see they're all staying in place. So the seed number, what this is actually used for is in order to change the randomization of the particles. So if we set this to say 50, What's going to happen is at 50, we should see randomization of the particles. However, there's a nuance to this. We're not going to see that randomization unless we change the source. All right, now it's being emitted from our faces, which is fine. 
Notice that we also have vertices and volume. But what's happening for the distribution is it's called jittered. Now, if we change this jittered to random, what we'll see is that we're going to be using a more random distribution. And this value here for the seed is going to start to come into play. It's going to be, again, a little bit harder for us to actually visualize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the end frame to 100. The lifetime, I'm going to leave it 200. And what we're going to see is that using random and using the seed value is going to allow the software to randomize the distribution of these, these vertices. Again, this one's a little bit harder for us to visualize. So I'm going to set this back to zero. And just note that this will take some playing around after you learn a little bit more about these particles. And then you can kind of play around and see how it affects your scene. So before we get too deep into particle settings, I want to bring back our ground. And I want to talk about collisions. So we're going to play a bit more with the particles. We're going to add some wind. We're going to make the particles move around. But I want them to interact with this plane. I want them to either stick to it or bounce off of it or do something with it. Right now, they're just falling through. And that's because we haven't told Blender that this plane is even there. The way that we do this is by going to our modifiers and adding a collision modifier. So when we select collision, now you can see the particles are bouncing off of it. Now, the collision settings, just like our particle settings, are found in another menu. So we have to go down to this menu here, and then we can start affecting them. So a couple things that we're going to do in here, and we're not going to go through a lot of settings, but we do want to talk about a few things. We've got permeability, which is just what it sounds. It allows some particles to go through. If we set this to, say, 0.5, it'll allow some of the particles to go through while others are bouncing off. You can see that 0.5 is halfway, and we can also drag this up, letting most of them go through, but some of them catch. We can drag it down, allowing most of them to bounce back, and some of them to go through, or setting it to zero, and none of them will go through. So pretty straightforward. Think about this as like a filter or a mesh. You can determine how many particles can get through. So this can be pretty neat if you're doing a particle system with something like dust or um, other elements that you want to catch in another, another object. In this case, we're just using two planes, but hopefully you can visualize that. Next is the stickiness. Now, as we start to drag the stickiness up, you'll notice that things go a little haywire. But as soon as it restarts the simulation or it starts playing back over, you can see what actually happens is instead of bouncing, those particles will actually stick. And based on their settings in terms of their lifetime, you'll notice that they start to disappear around 200 frames. They start to go away based on when they were created. So if we drop all of them at once, they're all going to disappear at the same time. Another thing that we can do is we can turn on kill particles. What kill particles is, is as soon as these particles actually hit this collider or the surface, it's going to kill them. So it's not going to take into account any of the particles about lifetime or any of those other settings. It's just going to instantly kill them as soon as it touches them. Notice that if we turn on permeability and kill particles, you'll notice that some of the particles go through. And if we reduce this, only the particles that are actually caught by this plane are going to be killed. All the rest will actually go through. So you can see that it, it's hard to tell here because of the number of particles. But if we select our particle system and we go back and increase this to, say, 5,000, so we're seeing more particles, it's a little bit easier for us to tell that not all of them are going through. If I turn all of them on at the same time at one frame, we're going to see all 5,000 drop at once. And as soon as they go through this plane, it'll be a little bit more apparent how many are getting caught. So you can see if we increase the permeability or decrease it, we're going to increase or decrease the number of particles that will go through. So with a low number, you can see that less particles go through. If we set it closer to zero, most of those 5,000 particles will be killed on impact, while some of them will still get through. So again, a pretty neat visualization trick. I'm going to turn off kill particles and permeability, 
And then I'm going to reduce the stickiness value back down to around 1. And you'll notice that they bounce up. So there are some other things that we want to talk about in here. But before we do, I'm going to go back to my particle settings. And I'm going to change the start and end. And I want them to start at 1, but end at 200. And again, what that's allowing us to do is just get more of an even drip of those. So back in the settings for our collision. What I want to do here is I want to actually rotate this. So what I'm going to do is use rotate or R on the keyboard, and we want to rotate this about Y. So again, there you can either use the rotation option or you can select it and hit R on the keyboard, Y, and then we want to rotate it this way. And again, this is another reason why we made it a little bit bigger. So now you can see that the particles are still bouncing but now they're bouncing off relative to whatever angle we set here. Because they're not randomized, it looks like a pretty even stream or flow. Even though they're dropping at different times, you can see that wave of particles that's flowing. We can use some of the settings to change what happens here. For example, dampening, we can turn this up. And you can see that instead of bouncing freely, it's starting to absorb some of that bounce. Also note that if we turn up stickiness, not all of them are going to bounce as much. If we're viewing this directly from the side, you can see that they are bouncing a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and pull this down just a bit. You can see that they bounce a little bit, but then they're sort of funneling off of here. We also have friction that we can increase. And when we increase friction, I'm going to rotate it for this one. You'll notice that some of them are starting to stick. While some of them still bounce and fall off, there are a handful of them that start to stick. So this looks more like snow falling on some object, and you can see it's kind of sticking, like snow on the roof. So using all of these different settings, we can really change the way that our particles in our system are starting to interact with other things. We're using very simple examples of a single plane for our ground and a single plane for our emitter, but again, these can be much more complex. Now that we have a basic understanding of this setup here, what I'm going to do is go back and start playing around with the particles a little bit more. So we've already talked about some of the basics, the number of particles, the starting and ending, the lifetime. The lifetime randomness is going to take into account that some of these are going to live longer than others. Not really something that we're going to get deep into, but again, notice that we have all these. Before we move on to other settings, I do want to make a note about these little dots on the right hand side. These will actually allow us to create keyframes, which means that we can change these settings at different times in our timeline. So adding a keyframe means that we can do things like turn on or off settings or change numbers. So for example, we can have the lifetime be shorter or longer at different points. So this means that we can just have a little bit more control over what happens. Note that inside of here for the sources, we have used modifier stack. This can be important, especially if we are taking a look at other elements in our modifier stack. So things like the uh, collisions or other particle systems or anything else that we're using inside of our modifier stack, then we might want to make use of that. Right now, all we have is a particle system or a collision system. So it, it's already going to use those. It doesn't really matter. But if we were doing things like mirroring or subdividing, and we were using our a, subdiv a subdivided surface that has a mirror on it, we would want to make sure that it collides with everything and it doesn't just fall off on part of it. As we scroll down, we've already talked briefly about the source and we're using faces. But again, it can come from a volume and it can come from vertices. You might want to use something like a volume if you want particles to emit in all directions from something. So for example, if you had a sphere, then you might want the particles to come out from there. We're not going to really get into making too many adjustments here, but we have already talked briefly about using random. If we turn this on to grid, you'll notice that the particles are falling in an exact grid. We can modify some settings. This can be helpful, but again, you can kind of see that we're, we're getting away from a more organic look and we're using a very structured look. So in our case, what we're going to do is keep it with jittered and that'll look a little bit more organic. As we scroll down, we're going to talk about cache in just a little bit. This is really important when we're rendering, 
but it's not something that we're going to talk about right now. We're going to move on to velocity. So as we look at velocity, this is what it sounds like. This is the speed at which the particles are coming out of whatever our emitter is. This can be really important, especially if we're shooting particles out in another direction. Say you're trying to emulate something like um, maybe sparks coming off of a tool or um, particles sh getting shot off of something. So this could be important. We could increase or decrease this value and change the speed at which the particles come from whatever our emitter is. So if we set this to zero, for example, you'll notice that our particles are still gonna come out of our emitter. And that's partially because we still have physics on and the physics is actually taking a look at gravity. But you'll notice that we've got things like Z and if we set this to negative, what's gonna happen is it's gonna try to shoot the particles in the negative Z direction whatever this, um, you know, whatever our normal values are gonna be. So you see that we've got this minus uh, 1.75. We need to make this rather large and we need to think about the direction in which it's going. So in our case, negative Z is actually down. So let's drag it the other direction and let's make it a positive value and see how that affects our system. So as we, this becomes more and more positive, they're actually jumping up before they come down. So negative in our case, based on our coordinate system is down and positive is up. So we can see that we're bouncing those up. And the normal value, again, if, if we zero this out, if we manually set this to zero, it's just gonna come out normal to whatever our object is. You'll notice that we also have some other things like randomize, this can increase or decrease the velocity. And again, the randomization, I believe is going to be partially coming from things like the seed number. So as we go a bit further down, we have a rotation value. It's not gonna make much sense because right now our particles don't actually have any objects applied. It's just going to be these round spheres. So we're not gonna really see anything, but note that using this rotation could change the orientation of the particles. The next thing that we do want to talk about is this physics setting. Now, this is where a lot of our properties are going to be coming from. So you can see that right now our physics type is Newtonian. There are some other types that we would want to talk about in a more exhaustive example. Keyed physics is probably the next biggest one that you would use, and that's generally used when you want the particles to go from one object to another. Um, in this case, we're, we're not really going to see any effects here, so I'm going to leave Newtonian on, and this is where we would adjust the mass. And mass really comes into play when we're talking about gravity. You'll notice that there are some force options here. We're going to leave all these at zero because our force is going to be based on an external force. We're going to add wind, but note that we do have some options here, and these forces are going to act directly on the particles. We've got uh, deflection and integration. Again, you can sort of expand these, but I don't really wanna get deep into all of the settings. And I'll be honest, I don't know what all of them do, but I wanna focus on the ones that are important for the majority of situations. Whenever you're getting started, some of the big ones that you wanna already know. So before we go any further and we talk about some more settings, let's briefly go back and let's just take a quick look to remind ourselves what we've done so far. So in the emission section, we're dealing with the number of particles, when they start, when they end, and how long they live. The sources section is determining where those particles are coming from and how they're distributed. As we scroll down, the velocity section is dealing with the initial speed and the direction at which the particles are traveling. And the physics section is determining how external forces are interacting with it. In most cases, Newtonian is going to be what you want for real life sort of um, analysis or, or simulation of what's actually happening, but there are some other options. Now, the next thing that we really want to think about is something called field weights. Field weights is where we really get into all of the different settings that are going to drastically change what's happening to our particles within this particle system. So for example, if I turn gravity off, then you'll notice that the particles that were moving, all of these particles that were moving are still moving whatever speed they were when I turned it off, 
but you'll notice that all of the other ones, all the ones that were on the top here, they appear to be growing vertically. Now, the reason they're growing vertically is because back in our velocity section, we've got positive 0.1 meters per second. So all of them are coming out of the emitter and they're traveling up vertically. If I set this to zero, they're all going to just stay on that emitter face. If we go down to our Z, and in this section, if we set this to a positive value, then you can see that they're gonna be going up. If we increase Y, or we increase object aligned to X, you'll notice that they start to move out in other directions. As we rotate this around, you can see that they're sort of growing as if they're floating away. Now, this is a very structured way because it's only taking a look at the velocity and the direction the velocity is interacting with it. So I'm gonna set these back to zero. I'm gonna set all three of these back to zero. And for right now, we're gonna set our normal value at minus 0.1, which means that they're gonna all come down. I rotate that back around a little bit. You can see that they're slowly growing down. So as we scroll back down, that was all based on the fact that we turned gravity off. Now, gravity at one is gonna act normally 9.81 meters per second squared, but we can affect that value and the mass of our particles by modifying our physics and our field weight. This can be very helpful, especially if you wanna to start to do particle simulations in space or you know, without gravity, then it can be helpful to turn that off. Also note that there are other settings for things like force, vortex, magnetic, and harmonic charge, and so on. A lot of these will make sense once we start to add in other forces. For right now, they don't really seem to make much sense, but you'll notice that we do have a lot of different control here. I'm not really gonna talk about any of the other settings, but notice that there are things like force field settings and vertex groups and so on. We're not gonna be talking about using vertex groups as a control or a source, but the next thing that we wanna mention is we wanna learn how to actually apply something to these. So if we were to pause this and we go to our viewport shading to render, you can see that it looks like we actually have particles here, but in reality, if we try to render this, nothing is happening with these because right now they're essentially just graphic representations of our particles. We actually need to tell Blender what we want those particles to be. So the best way for us to do this is to take a look at the, uh, the, the source for these. So right now, they're being emitted from the face, which is the face of the plane we created, and the distribution is jittered. But how do we actually tell it that we want it to come from an object? How do we say, we want it to be this cube, for example. So to find where we can use that cube as some of our objects, we actually need to go down to a render setting. So when we come all the way down to render, the render as is a halo right now. And there are a couple of other options where we can change it to things like a line or a path, but we wanna set it to object and then we wanna set the object under this instance object. We can use this little picker. We can pick the cube. And now you can see each of those particles are little cubes. They're still gonna behave the same, but now we can get a little bit better idea what some of the settings do. So if we play through, you can now see all the little cubes are being dropped. So when we use this option, it helps us because, well, it really does a few things. If we are rendering this out, the light behaves differently when it hits these cubes. It's gonna bounce off of it different as if it's a cube rather than a perfectly smooth sphere. So if you're making something like a dust particle, you typically wanna go in and use something like an icosphere or a UV sphere, but you don't wanna really use a UV sphere. That'll be perfectly round and icosphere will give you a little bit better. Or we can take something like this box, we can go into our modifiers, we can add a subdivision surface, and you can see that it changed all of our particles. They're all now these little subdivided boxes. So they have a lot of little facets or flat faces, so they're gonna behave slightly different. I'm gonna just get rid of that because it's gonna help us see a little bit better things like rotation if we use the cube, but just note that we can do something like that. Back in our particle settings, now that we have cubes, 
It'll help us understand a couple of the other settings, such as randomize and rotation. So if we turn rotation on, we go in here, we can turn on randomize for our rotation, and let's go ahead and jump back to the beginning and play through. And now as we look at these cubes, you can see that they're at different orientations. This is something we couldn't see before with the little spheres. So the randomize is helping us drop them or show them at different orientations. So as we play through, we can see that they're bouncing off of the surface or doing whatever we did with our collision modifier, because now we're dropping something that's just not a round sphere. And this can be any shape. If we go into edit mode and we, let's say, select a face and we simply move it in the Y direction, you can see all of our little objects are mapped based on that. So we can make all those changes. We can re-manipulate it any way we want because it's grabbing that information. And because we're using the modifier stack, anything we change, if we subdivide this, it's going to affect our particles, our, our particle system. Let's also take a look at some other options where we can modify things like the particle sizes. So as you look through these options, we can again tweak the number of particles, their orientation, we can use that, uh, the rotation option. And we can also, again, we can randomize things like their speed. Some of them can go faster than others. Some of them can go slower. Um, we can use some of those settings to, to change the direction that they're traveling. So some of them are gonna go this direction in the Y, some of them are gonna go in the X and so on. So again, it gives you a little bit more of an organic feel. Now it is exactly the same every time we play through, but using some of these randomized numbers and randomizations can help you get a little bit more realism out of it. Once again, I don't wanna go into a ton of settings. I don't really wanna talk a ton about all these different things because there is an endless number of options that we can go through and we're already at 30 minutes. So the last thing that I wanna do is I wanna talk about one more thing that we can use to affect this. So I'm gonna just go to Shift A, or again, we could go to Add, and I wanna note that we have a section called Force Field. Now, force fields are a way that we can affect our particles. We can do things like add a force, add some magnetic attraction, we can charge particles, we can have a guide curve, we can add turbulence and drag and so on. But the main thing that I wanna focus on here is wind. I'm gonna add wind. And the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna move that wind. So I'm gonna to come to my side view and I'm gonna say GX to move it in the X direction. I'm gonna say GZ to move it up in the Z direction. And I'm gonna say R about Y to rotate it. And you can see that as I do that, it's actually blowing the particles. So they were falling straight down and now they're blowing away. One thing we can do also is we can scale this up to make sure that it is large enough or small enough to affect all of our particles. And then we have settings for the wind on its own. So for example, you can see that we've got the strength. We can reduce the strength. You can see that it's pulling them in that direction or we can push them in that direction. We can increase or decrease the flow. And depending on the mass of our particles, the number of particles and so on, these settings will have differing effects. So it really depends on all of our settings. So I'm gonna reduce the strength here. I'm gonna take it down I'm going to take the flow down. And notice again there there's other settings, location and rotation. We've got fall off, wind factor, and absorption. But what I really want to focus on here is I want to give you uh, another couple tips for keyframing. And what I mean by keyframing is when we're doing particle simulation, let's say that we have this fan. We want all the particles to fall, and then we want to turn the fan on. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to the strength and the flow, noting that we're at frame one. The strength and the flow, we're gonna click this little icon. We're gonna set it to zero for both of these. And then we're gonna click this little icon next to it. And what that allows us to do is set a keyframe. So now we're gonna just scrub through. We're gonna let these particles fall until let's say frame 80. And then at frame 80, we're gonna kick the strength on. We're gonna kick the flow on. I'm gonna click that little button again. 
And now what we've done is we've turned the fan on. So let's go back to frame one and let's just play through and see what happens. So you can see the fan turns on and it begins blowing. But you'll notice what happened is it started to kick on the fan linearly through this distribution. So here's another thing that we need to be mindful of is these keys oftentimes will be some sort of distribution between the start and the end. So if we go back to frame one now and we play it, now you can see I move that frame and now it's turning on and we're blowing the particles away. If I wanna turn it back off, I just pick another frame and I set these to zero, set both of them to zero and I'll click the keyframe to set another keyframe, go back to the beginning, allow them to fall, kick the fan on, turn the fan back off. So you can see here we're affecting the particles, it's changing how they're falling in their distribution. So again, we have a lot of control over what's happening in these scenes. It doesn't just have to be turning on a particle and letting it fall, but we can change whether it bounces off of something, whether it sticks to something, whether that object kills the particle so they disappear. We can have things like gravity turned on or off, a velocity. We can set it to an object. So you see we have all these little cubes. We can randomize their orientation. We can even randomize their size and, and all other sorts of options. We added uh, wind in this case, and using some keyframing, we were able to turn that on and off. So once again, I really didn't want to get too deep into physics because it is a massive topic. I really wanted to cover the basics that we need to understand when we're setting up, a, even in this case, I would consider this a very simple particle system. We're not having the particles really do much else but fall and have some friction and some dampening to another object. And then, of course, we added the fan. We turned the fan on and off. But it's important to note that there are tons of settings here, and it's a really good idea for you just to come up with a simple example like this and play around with setting them. Because if you don't understand the basics of setting up an emitter, setting up a collision, and even doing things like turning on and off the wind, it's going to be really hard to progress and even follow other tutorials that are teaching you how to do more advanced things and talk about rendering and so on. The last thing that I do want to leave you with on particle systems is going to be the cache. So inside of here, the cache and baking our particle system is something that we need to do before we actually decide to render an animation. So if you want to take what you've done here and you want to turn it into an animation, you want to render everything, apply appearances and so on, then what you want to do is you want to bake the physics. Now, a simple system like this actually bakes pretty quickly and we can play through the changes as long as we don't go crazy with the number of particles. So if I set this to 50,000, for example, that is a lot more particles. And you'll notice that things, you know, obviously it depends on your computer, but you'll notice that things start to slow down a bit more. If we go crazy and we set this to 100,000, then it's gonna be even more particles. The complexity of the object that you're aligning to the particle system, when we turn the fan on and off, you can see that things start to slow down a bit. And this is the nature of these particle systems. So as you're designing these particle systems, you should think about simple examples, low number of particles, and playing around with the settings. Once you're happy with the settings for 500 particles, if you wanna do a longer animation or simulation, then you can turn those up quite a bit. And at that stage, that's when you wanna consider caching that. Now, you'll note that it's already committed frames to memory. And in order for us to clear that out, we actually have to do a like move something in our scene and then reset it. And I'm not really sure why you need to do that, but I'm just gonna hit G to move my particle system, then right click to put it back where it goes. And you'll notice now it only has one frame in memory. We can convert this to a disk cache. This design has, hasn't actually been saved, so it won't let me do that but this will let you store the cache locally, keeping the Blender file smaller, or if you just simply bake it, it's gonna save it into the Blend file. So if we click Bake, what's happening is it's going through the frames in our timeline, and it's calculating the physics that happen. 
what this means is it's much quicker for us to just scrub through that. So while it was playing slowly before, it was because it was calculating each frame as it was playing. And while this is really easy for it to do when we're talking about 500 or 1,000 particles, when we're talking about 100,000 particles and all of them interacting with something, the wind is blowing them, it makes it much harder to do. So you can see here, once we bake that, it's much easier for us to just scrub through and see what happens when the wind turns on and so on. But you'll notice that as soon as we do that, our settings and options are grayed out. We can't change the number of particles anymore. We can't adjust the frame rates or anything like that because it's already committed everything that happens physically in this physics animation, in this, in this instance of a particle system. It's already calculated it, figured out what it is, it's saved it to its memory, and it allows us to quickly and easily go back and go through this. So if we try to make changes to something, so for example, if we scale this particle system up and we scrub through here, you'll notice that the particles are falling through where the end of that face used to be because it doesn't understand the reference. It doesn't know that the size of that has changed, so it's not gonna be able to update. And if we wanted to update, what we need to do is we need to go back to our cache, we need to delete the bake, and then we need to recalculate it. Now again, it's already got something saved, so I suggest that you move something and put it back to help just clear it out, and then rebake it again. Now rebaking it without actually playing it on the screen happens relatively fast, but it is an important step, especially once you're happy with all your settings and you have a large number of particles, then you can see here now they're treating the updated size of our ground plane like it should, and they're falling off where they need to. But once we've actually gone through the process of baking it, then just playing through it quickly, we can see the physics, we know exactly what happens. And again, if we want to make any changes to the majority, of, some changes you can make, but the majority of it, like the number of particles and when they start and when they end and so on, we need to go back and we need to delete the cache and rebake it again. So I know that that was, geez, oh, almost 45 minutes at this point, but hopefully that gives you a good idea on how to create a basic particle system. Now this basic particle system is typical of what you would use for just about everything, whether it's snow falling or dust or sprinkles on a donut, this is going to be the way that you set up a particle system. And at this stage, if this is something that you think that you're going to progress, if you want to look at particles flowing over a design that you created, for example, you want to fake a wind tunnel, or you want to have dust falling in the sky so you have that, that sort of dusty look for a rendered image, what you can do is you can create these particle systems, and you can create a render at a single point in time when you've got those dust particles in the air. So again, it's gonna be exactly the same. You need to figure out things like the object that you're gonna use for those particles. You need to figure out if you're gonna have wind or collision or any other influences. And it's fun to play around with. You can create pretty basic examples quickly with just a couple objects, planes, and you can see we use the default cube. You can make adjustments, but I strongly suggest that you, at least when you're starting and playing, use a small number of particles. Use 100, use 500, but don't go much past that while you're playing around with the settings because they will react really quickly. So at this stage, if you have any questions, uh, if, if you want to progress with this, um, I, I didn't put any links to any tutorials in the description of this video because there's so many out there on so many different topics. You can find ones to teach you how to use physics to liquefy an object or grow an object or dust in the wind simulation or set it on fire, anything that you want, you can find it. So uh, I don't wanna link it to anything in the description because there are so many, but if there's something specific that you're trying to do and you can't figure out, then obviously leave a comment, let me know, send me an email. I might have seen a video somewhere on it that I thought was good and I'll you know, send it out as a reference. But if you have any questions, obviously let me know. And as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.